I think that really we should think of all these little parks along the East River as connected with Gateway National. And, and kids and people could take the ferry up from Gate, Gateway National and come to Brooklyn Bridge State Park and come to Bushwick Inlet Park and come to Transmitter Park and come to a park on the Newtown Creek and then over to Long Island City. I just really think that this waterway is so, it's such a beautiful natural resource. It, it, it's got tides, it's got currents. We can bring back things like oysters. And I just think that a city is big and great as New York needs to have green space as beautiful and big as the city itself. There are so many interests in the environmental improvement of a place like Newtown Creek. There's working waterfront access points that they're, the crumbling bulkheads have prevented businesses from bringing barges in for years. There's ways to build bulkheads that bring back oysters and fisheries and build new habitat and still allow for a working waterfront. There's opportunities for education and parks and open space for communities in Brooklyn and Queens that have never had waterfront access and open space. And all of these things combine to make our city better. And so there are so many interests in a clean, healthy, restored Newtown Creek that we're gonna get there regardless of what's going on in Washington. I started participating in 1996. That's when I jumped in. And there was a lot going on. I mean, uh, the oil spill, the sewage treatment plant, the development plant. The community started asking for open space. I and some people that I knew had projects for opening up the land and the waterfront that had been fenced off for a very long time, and the community had no access to it. Phyllis Jampolsky had a group that wanted to restore the pool, McCarran Park pool, uh, had been closed for years. We wanted to open that up forever and ever and ever. It was a group called Waterways and Green Views, and they wanted to develop composting programs. But the same group that worked with George Trakas at the under Greenpoint Avenue. The WNYC transmitter tower was right there. So it was a city-owned parcel of land, this, this thing about who will give us the land so that we could have a park. So the, the city was able to take their own land and turn it into a park. But it's only one little acre. And so on, on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, when the weather gets beautiful, it's really not even that pleasant anymore because an acre for this kind of density Feel this breeze. In the summertime, the breeze is like this. So everybody wants to be there. People have their babies on the grass. People have their dogs on the grass. People are angry with each other. And my thing is, yeah, of course, because it's one acre. People need more space to relax. They promised a 28-acre park 11 years ago in exchange for these towers. And they changed the zoning, did not purchase the land, and it's gone up in value exponentially, but still needs to be the park. Bloomberg administration rammed, th rammed through a rezoning resolution for the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront. They rezoned about 185 blocks that would just promote, you know, crazy amount of luxury residential buildings, especially towers on the waterfront and increasing the population by thousands. So they uh, promised creating about 50 acres of open space on the waterfront, and the center of that would be Bushwick Inlet Park, which is, would be 27 acres. Our oh. whole chant, our whole rant, our whole focus is this is not a gift. This is not a gift from the Parks Department. This is not a gift from Mayor de Blasio. This is not a gift for from New York City. This was a transaction. This was a deal made when the city went and took 185 blocks on both sides of this and rezoned it for residential and let the developers come in like sharks and have their way. Most of the properties were part of the manufactured gas and original oil refinery industries in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So there is uh, coal tar and, um, and numerous uh, you know, 
volatile organic chemicals, you know, as byproducts of that, and um, oil refinery that's down there. And, um, and, and then, yeah, there's the base, what's called the Bayside Fuel site is where there are massive dormant oil tanks. And it's all contaminated. And what they're wondering is if when they do acquire this piece of property, when, if, uh, or whoever does get it, and how polluted it is underneath because they have no access to test it. Right where this blue area is, is what was on fire a year ago um, or six weeks. And it was another warehouse next to this one. And now the property is for sale. Norman Brodsky is trying to sell it to the highest bidder. He built on the land knowing that it was a promised park. And the city didn't buy it then. And that's too bad, but they still uh, need to acquire it now before it goes to developers. Well, we've had a rally at City Hall. We've finally gotten uh, the mayor to even address the situation. We had a rally on the property. We've had a flash mob. We've had a occupy the inlet with kayaks and canoes and a sailboat come from the water side. And then all people in a bit of a rally on the land side just all to bring attention to this. So we go to a lot of meetings and we're not gonna stop until we have our park. Borough President Eric Adams had this idea. He said, you know, I really think we should have a sleepover in the park. If you don't build it, we're coming anyway. We're in such need of a park. Other politicians came earlier in the evening and then left, but Carolyn Maloney, the Congresswoman, and Borough President Eric Adams, they slept here on this concrete in tents all night. And that was in the New York Times. So that's why I say, I think it was a, a marker in our fight that, whoa, these people are serious. They're out there in the pouring buckets of rain. <laughs> There's lots of sites here in Greenpoint and Williamsburg uh, that uh, have underground contaminants where for uh, decades or really sometimes a century or more, different businesses have been uh, dumping pollutants onto the ground and they've been seeping into the soil and going into the groundwater. And now what we're seeing is, uh, if we look around here, is there's lots of new construction. Uh, and what they've done in many instances is they've had to remediate uh, because there's been contaminants in the soil and the groundwater and the soil gas. So the Brownfield Opportunity Planning Study is funded by New York State. This is a statewide program that they offer to help communities plan uh, constructive use and reuse for blighted and contaminated properties. This Brownfield Opportunity Area was conducted to state standards. It is now designated and therefore any project that happens in the area that meets the goals of the plan uh, can be eligible for additional brownfield cleanup tax credits. The brownfield standards are pretty rigorous in terms of cleanup or capping. The city wants to um, rebuild on brownfields because those are already developed sites and rather than take over undeveloped sites, we should try to preserve open green space as it is and rebuild on already developed sites. <laughs> Newtown Creek Superfund site hasn't yet begun the dredging process because they haven't yet figured out what they're going to do. Right now we're at a very critical time for Newtown Creek Superfund because we are finishing up this, the city, the state and the federal agencies are finishing up their assessment of really what their idea of the risks to the ecosystem are, to the people of the community uh, and what they're going to do about it as the cleanup progresses. In 2010, Newtown Creek and Gowanus both got designated federal Superfund sites. Gowanus is on a much quicker track to get cleaned up. How do you expedite those processes is, is pressure 
from the community level as well as from a city level. Gowanus is very different in that there's a lot more residential development going on. There's a lot more people living uh, and breathing, you know, right next to it. And I feel like we need to have more of that here in Newtown Creek. The focus uh, of the city really has been for many, many years now, these two Superfund sites, the Gowanus Canal and Newtown Creek. And so if you're working on waters in New York, you're working with the communities around these two hotbeds of toxic pollution uh, and, and no bit better partner in this region than the Newtown Creek Alliance, North Brooklyn Boat Club, uh, and really dozens of other community groups in, Green, in Greenpoint, Long Island City, uh, and all over Newtown Creek. I work for Newtown Creek Alliance, which is a community nonprofit dedicated to restoring and revealing and revitalizing Newtown Creek. When you paddle in the city, you've got, you know, big tugboats and ferry boats, and you're kind of in the ocean, and the city's there, and it's beautiful, and it's nice, and it's exciting to be out on the waterways in the city. What I'm doing is pursuant to Alberti's statement about architecture saying that a good city, which an architect designs, has clean air, uh, viable water, good quality water, uh, good urban planning. Our first patrol into Newtown Creek was in 2002, and when we came up, there were vehicles in the water, there were petroleum spills and barrels everywhere, people that hadn't seen the water of Newtown Creek in decades. Uh, and we started working with the communities and building this record of, this photographic and video-based record of all the pollution that's currently, that was at the time oozing into the creek. That's where really the, the impetus behind the Exxon Mobil Greenpoint oil spill uh, litigation popped up. We started working with the Attorney General's office uh, in 2002 and three and four to try to get a handle on all of these, these decade old uh, legacy pollution issues. And from there, we've seen uh, immeasurable improvement, but we still have a very long way to go. If uh, we could do a small raft with some kelp, just to see if, for example, when salinity changes, what happens to the kelp? I did go with my colleague Colleen Fitzgibbon, with Patterson Beckwith, and with Willis Elkins uh, from the North Brooklyn Boat Club along the shore by boat. This is a navigational channel. It's like 25 feet deep here. And then you have a layer of sludge. It's about 10 to 15 feet. It's essentially like an artificial. It's accumulated. That has the, some of the heavy contaminants in it. But also there are certain areas, like where we are now, this isn't really that contaminated, the sediment. It's much when you go further back in. NCA, we've always been interested in is, is the tributaries. Oh, right. You have Dutch Kills, which unfortunately the water's too high. We can go near it. Water's too high to get in there. Then Whale Creek. Is it too high? Uh, because there's a really low bridge, yeah. And um, Mass Pets Creek, East Branch, and English Kills. So I'm just going to take a measurement here. There's a meter here, and so it has different, uh, there's different factors on it. There's dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature. Um, but yeah, it's a standard sort of uh, multi-parameter meter. We've been working on a project for several years where we measure dissolved oxygen. Originally, the instrument was used and it was dragged behind a canoe. Uh, but what we found is that in order to be able to compare our measurements with measurements being taken by regulatory agencies and others, we needed to take a stationary measurement. And so we're going to set up a station at the North Brooklyn Boat Club where we measure dissolved oxygen all year long, every day, uh, every minute. Historically, what this whole area was like was this marsh and how we just totally lost it. So here's a cool project over here. See the silver boxes in between? This is a Professor Duran we work with at LaGuardia. She's really interested in ways that we can bring back some of the salt marsh grasses. And so there's an idea of basically making a planter and you put it along as a bulkhead, a flat edge, which is what most of the creek is. And then they sit at the same elevation they would naturally. So at high tide, their roots are able to get water uh, from the rising tide. And then the rest of the time they sit dry like they would in a natural marsh. This is the 
project we did called the Living Dock because the creek has really been turned into this bathtub with these straight walls. So we've been finding ways that we see oysters and mussels coming back and finding little crevices to live in. Is there other ways we can design habitat for them? Each crate has like a different uh, habitat, if you will. And uh, so this one, so this is old clam shells. So we're seeing if like any, if there's oysters or mussels that will affix to the shells. It acts like a reef so that there's like fish and sh shrimp is actually the most common thing. Amphipods and smaller plankton. Uh, the exciting thing is we have seen a couple mussels attach themselves to some of these shells. An oyster, you know, can clean like 30 gallons of water uh, a day. So this is actually the best one for fish and shrimp. Um, there's always, there is, there's a fish right there. So yeah, in the summer, lots and lots of fish, but uh, yeah, small little guy. And this water is so green right now, this is really abnormal. The visibility is like eight inches or something here. You know, it's just a bloom of an algae that's really, really going nuts. My guess is that the dissolved oxygen is gonna be really, really high. There's not a lot of active seepage coming in like there used to be. Um, which is a big issue, but you know, up until 10 years ago, there was oil still coming in off the shore right. into the creek. So, what stuff? Uh, well, I'm, <laughs> legal action essentially. Riverkeeper filed a lawsuit, and then this, the state Exxon also. Essentially, Exxon has been cleaning it up since it was discovered in the late 70s. And then it got to a point when Riverkeeper started coming down and doing patrols in the early 2000s, and they just said, like, wow, this is really not great. And so there was a couple lawsuits, and, uh, and the big one was really also a bunch of members from the community signed on uh, to say, like, you're not doing a good enough job. And um, so that led to more enforcement of the cleanup. It's really the state coming down uh, with the hammer to, do a, to make them do a, a more... The rest of New York. New York State. Uh, they're the ones who oversee the cleanup, so they've been really doing more enforcement and regulation of the cleanup. It's complicated because the creek itself is under federal designation for cleanup. The Greenpoint oil spill on land is under state jurisdiction. So what happens when you go from land to the sea? It, 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 they have to have a lot of conversations and figure that out. If there was a plume of oil underneath the ground and they discovered through the Superfund investigation that it was seeping into the creek, then they could address that upland source. Something's going to take years to grow something and take it out. My interest in the river is to get the contaminants out tomorrow. And if that's mechanical dredging, that's mechanical dredging, because these contaminants pose a, a present, current, and expansive risk to the public health uh, issues, the ecosystem itself. There's fish that are toxic and going to be toxic for decades to come from Superfund sites from here all the way up to the Upper Hudson. The stuff needs to come out now. Physical and so there's shipping. definitely places and there's definitely ideas that can help with bioremediation throughout the entire New York Harbor but in places that are like Newtown Creek and Gowanus Canal that are the largest, most toxic, contaminated waterways in the entire country, we need to clean this stuff now. We need to get it out tomorrow. For the super fun cleanup of the creek, there's uh, six responsible parties, and that's five corporations, Exxon, BP, Phelps Dodge, National Grid, and um, Chevron, and so, um, and then the city of New York. The five corporations have sort of formed their own entity called the Newtown Creek Group, all these major billionaire corporations in the city of New York, essentially the DEP. 
the way that our sewer system's designed is that we dump all the sewage into the waterways uh, whenever there's a rainstorm. A CSO is a combined sewer overflow, and it's, a, it's one of the pipes where when it's raining, the combined effluent of storm water as well as the sewage coming down, our toilets and showers and drains and everything, is flushing out to the waterways. And so New York City has this combined sewer system, and we have over 450 of these pipes throughout the city releasing billions of gallons of untreated sewage and stormwater every year. East side below 70th Street, and then the west side below like 20th Street. So like all of lower Manhattan sewage comes to this treatment plant. How do they get it over there? There's a big pipe running underneath the East River, yeah. So it doesn't just dump untreated into the water. When it rains, it does, though, because when it rains, you have all the runoff from the street goes to the same system. The treatment plant hits capacity, and so it backs up. So that Manhattan pipe, the pipe that goes from Manhattan to this treatment plant, if it's raining, they'll just shut that pipe off, and then they'll open up all these outfalls, like on the east side of Manhattan into the East River. Some of the easiest things to do are um, the stormwater management and that addresses the combined sewer overflow problem that we have and is plaguing all of our waterways around the city. And that has to do with creating absorptive surfaces that take that water before it hits the catch basins and the stormwater treatment plants. We are working with big housing organizations to do it on a grand scale, especially green roofs. So green roofs that capture the first one inch of rainfall and delay it so it doesn't hit the stormwater system at the peak moments when everything else is reaching that system at the same time. The system can't handle it and releases untreated sewage into the waterways. With Newtown Creek Alliance, we've been working on bioremediation, micromediation. So looking at different fungi that either break down petroleum-based products, but also other naturally occurring microorganisms that can break down things even like lead. There's a, a huge amount of oxygen in the water, which sounds like a good thing, except that we know it's coming from these algae blooms. And the downside about that is that these algae only survive a certain amount of period of time. And when they die off, they decompose and take a lot of that oxygen with them. So the creek, some of the big issues with the creek is the oxygen is always out of balance, going up and down. So you have really highs, really high highs, and really low lows. And the really low lows are, are detrimental because then it's hard for fish and other organisms to survive. Eutrophication. Hmm? That's eutrophication. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So when you have the sewage discharges particularly, you're getting all these nutrients pumped into the waterway. So the city is a way to fix this dissolved oxygen level is they've installed in parts of the creek an aeration system so that they manually um, oxygenate the water. And it runs during the summer because when there's hotter temperatures, there's less oxygen in the water. So it's a way for them to meet the standard so they can ensure that fish can survive here. Right. But it's a really short-sighted approach and it doesn't address the real problem, which is the sewage coming in and the nutrient overload. For Professor Duran, this is like what she's really been focusing on. She's doing research at the lab at LaGuardia right. about how they can also uh, reduce the sewage bacteria. So they have like really amazing results of where they take a sample from Dutch Kills yeah. after a rainstorm that's off the charts with awful bacteria. They'll do a control tank and a tank with rib muscles and they test it after you know 12 hours, 24 hours right. and just dramatic reduction. It's really cool. This is one of the older buildings on the creek. This was part of Charles Pratt's refinery, which eventually became Standard Oil. This is actually the spot where there has been some seepage coming out. There's some oil under the ground here. It's kind of a shame, though. That means one of the issues on the creek is that the cheapest, most effective way to shore up your property and prevent erosion and also contain <laughs> anything like oil coming off of it is to put these steel bulkheads in, go really deep. And they really, it's unfortunate because there's no 
potential for any habitat. The bulkheads are definitely part of the problem. What we have in Newtown Creek are some old crumbling bulkheads that are the, that are the perfect home for mussels and oysters and critters and habitat. And then we have new sheet pile steel bulkheads that are just flat, unapproachable walls for the marine environment. And in that case, one of those bulkheads might be better for shipping, another one might be better for habitat, but there exists out there third designs and fourth designs and fifth designs that can have both. This is where they're doing most of the cleanup of the oil spill. The oil spill is mixed in with this groundwater, and so throughout the whole neighborhood of Eastern Greenpoint here, they pump the groundwater that has the oil in it, and they pump it at two different places, and one is this, the, the structure, the gray structure with the red lining on top. And so within there and next to it, they basically set up like a, a treatment facility so that they take the oil out of the water and are able to collect it. And then they discharge, if you see these bubbles coming in, they discharge the clean groundwater into the creek. They're cleaning stuff that's underground. They're taking oil out of the groundwater. This whole area, this is called the Turning Basin. So this is like the widest point in the creek. Right. So this is historically where the tankers would have to come all the way back here to turn around because the rest of it was too narrow. You can look on old maps. This was, of course, all marsh. Maspeth Creek was a really fantastic marsh. So the interesting thing about the Turning Basin is that it's also, uh, this is where the sediment contamination appears to be the, the highest. Oh, okay. This is kind of like the hot spot. And it's, it's partially because, I mean, you had the oil refiners up there, but this was all manufactured gas plants. And then you also had Phelps Dodge on the other side. So heavy metals and PCBs and coal tar and stuff. This is one of the contractors for Superfund Cleanup. So they have data. <laughs> they do have data, yeah. They collect it as part of the Superfund investigation, but they're hired by the people who are responsible for the pollution. Uh -huh. And they're interpreting it as well. This is waste management. Oh. And those green things are going on a train. Sanitation comes with a curbside pickup. You put it in a big pile and they put, they put it in the green trains. And there's a line here that, that runs, yeah, railroad, and it runs out of the city. So that's our trash. So once, once the EPA figured out what was wrong with the creek, and now that it's got a 10 volume set of information saying what the risks are to the ecosystem, now comes the time when the government is figuring out what the plan is gonna be for getting all those toxics out of the environment and rebuilding what, what we should have had as a functioning watershed. In 2017, Riverkeeper is gonna be launching on a large community-driven project to create a vision for Newtown Creek to figure out exactly what the community wants to see for the restoration potential, the remediation outcomes, the recreation, and the climate resilience for our shared waterway. We're gonna include the city, we're gonna include the state, federal agencies, the industrial polluters, the working waterfront, the residents, the fishermen, the kayakers, the boaters, and everyone that has an interest in the creek. The visioning process that Riverkeeper is going to be leading soon uh, is, it uses as its, as its jumping off point the Brownfield Opportunity Area Plan that was put together by Newtown Creek Alliance, Greenpoint Manufacturing Design Center, and Riverkeeper through a New York State uh, Brownfield Opportunity Area grant. 
the polluters and the EPA get together and they put out a couple proposals. So it's incumbent upon the community now to start working uh, with the agency to call for their own vision and to show the government what the community wants to see on the backside of this cleanup. What the, what the creek should look like when the cleanup is over and how we're gonna get from here to there. Because right now in 2017, that's when all these plans are getting written. So eventually, all the waterfront will be connected, all the new development will be required to provide esplanade all along the, on the waterway. So, but if you start off at East River State Park, which is North 6, and then you, and you keep going through East River State Park, and then you get to the Bushwick Inlet Park, and right now you've got um, the soccer field. Next to that is a city storage site. It's 11 acres. That was the parcel of land we were fighting for. So that'll be park. And, it's, and that from Bushwick and the park will be 27 acres in total. And it'll reach from the state park all the way down to the inlet and curve around the inlet. Then you're just going to have to have the little esplanades going down to Transmitter Park. Then you're going to have your little esplanades built out by the developers um, until you get to, uh, I guess, Box Street Park and, ba and Barge Park, which is sort of at the mouth of the Newtown Creek. So now we're at the mouth of the Newtown Creek. We go around and you start reaching up the Newtown Creek on the Brooklyn side and you get to the end of uh, Manhattan Avenue, there's kind of a kayak launch there. Then you could keep going down and you're gonna have the North Brooklyn Boat Club. And then under the Pulaski Bridge, then you get to the park that's where the um, sewage treatment plant is. It's a nature walk. The last time we talked, we were in the fight and we were feeling discouraged, I think, because it was not looking good. The expense of this parcel of land was so enormous uh, that it seemed like the city of New York would not possibly be able to afford it. And so the big change is now I'm standing here and we did, we got it, we won. The city of New York came forward with um, the money and they bought the missing piece of the park. So we're very thrilled, we're very excited, we're very grateful that it turned out this way because now there's going to be a beautiful park on the edge of this magnificent East River for future generations to come and relax and enjoy and look at this unbelievable view of New York City. I've had future generations in my mind all the time since I, since I came to Greenpoint because actually when his dad was my little baby, there was no, we never got to the edge. We never looked at the water. We never, I, my favorite phrase is catch a breeze. With, with my son, we never could catch a breeze. So I sort of felt like, oh, here's, I have my second chance now to try to fix, help, uh, you know, continue the fight to make Greenpoint and Williamsburg um, more open and friendly and healthier for all the people that live here. It should be like a basic right a New Yorker right to have a beautiful park right in your neighborhood.